This episode of Patriot Plates is brought to you by SaveTheBrave.org, connecting veterans to change lives. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. I'm retired Marine Corps Major Scott Husing, and I'm standing here on the deck of the USS Midway, the longest serving aircraft carrier in US history. Over 200,000 sailors served aboard this carrier from the Vietnam War to the Persian Gulf War and many humanitarian missions in between. Today, the USS Midway rests in San Diego Bay. And just over that bridge is the Naval Air Station and Naval Amphibious Base where we train our US Navy SEALs. Coronado is an island rich in military tradition and a great place to find veterans. We scoured the streets looking for veteran license plates and also found naval aviator plaques posted outside of veteran homes. In this USS Midway series, we visit with some veterans volunteering on the USS Midway and veterans now living in Coronado. Welcome to the special edition of Patriot Plates on the USS Midway. served in the Navy in World War I, so he had a little influence. Well, I enlisted in the Navy in December of 42. I was one month short of 18. And they put me into what they call a V1 program, which is sort of a pool to tie up personnel so there wouldn't every, not everyone would be drafted into the Army. I didn't get called until uh, later in 43, where the, uh, the Navy finally sent me to a duty post at the uh, University of Dubuque in Dubuque, Iowa. While we were there, we were taking regular university or, or college courses, and one of them was uh, physics. And uh, I happened to get 100 in the final exam in physics. So the Navy sent us down to the University of Illinois in what they call the physics major program. And they never really told us why, why we were there. In fact, the entire time we were there, they never told us why we were there. But uh, that was a, uh, actually a part of the Manhattan Project. The Navy was really interested in the development of nuclear power. I spent most of my time taking regular university courses, but I also was assigned to, uh, to do some work in the, in the cyclotron laboratory. This is a huge electromagnet, which is shielded by a double tank of water. They, they use this to do some of the experimental work and also making some of the measurements that they needed in order to go ahead and try to develop the bomb. We were working with some people from the University of Chicago where they are actually developing that first reactor. 
and the fellows that had developed the, uh, the first reactor that was Fermi and Teller and Allison and Shine. They were teaching classes. In fact, Fermi actually taught a, uh, the beginning course in physics. And uh, Edward Teller, who was considered the father of the H-bomb, I know whenever he would come into the classroom, why people would applaud. Hiroshima. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. Let there be no mistake. We shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. But the greatest marvel is not the size of the enterprise, its secrecy, or its cost but the achievement of scientific brains in making it work. The Navy is big on training people for their jobs, but you see, at that time, there were no jobs in, uh, in nuclear physics. So they were really in the process of training people uh, for the future, what they call the nuclear navy. I was assigned to a ship that was used in the uh, atom bomb test out in the Marshall Islands or near the island of Bikini. My job was actually typing up uh, coded and, and decoded messages you know, for uh, what was being done. And they had set up a whole fleet of uh, obsolete and other captured German vessels, which were used as, a, as a basically targets to measure the radiation. And they had animals on board that would, uh, mostly rats and guinea pigs, but they did have some larger animals where they wanted to measure the, the actual radiation effects on, on uh, living tissue. They exploded at 500 feet in the air. There's the target. There it goes. The fourth atomic bomb has been successfully detonated. We were 25 miles away, uh, so we were pretty safe, and they had us face away from the bomb. They knew exactly when it was going to be detonated, and they, they had us face, face away at, and look at the bulkhead, and the, the flash that hit uh, was really very intense, and I could see that that could have caused damage to your eyes if you looked at it. Then we turned around, you could see the cloud going up, I don't recall that we uh, heard any, felt any shock wave. And the sound in, in 25 miles is pretty well attenuated. And that was a very rapid explosion, so it was sounded more like a pop. And it actually sank five of the ships. And then on the uh, second test that was conducted underwater, that uh, was exploded 90 feet underwater, and that sank 10 more of the ships.
15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, fire. Also produced a rain cloud of, of highly radioactive material which fell on the ships and, and the water evaporated but the radiation remained and they had to actually sink most of the ships right on the site because uh, they, were, they were too radioactive to, to bring back and cut up for scrap. We didn't even know about the bomb until they, we heard they dropped it on uh, Hiroshima and then three days later they dropped it on Nagasaki. And it was the, uh, the emperor finally intervened to, uh, to th really throw in the towel because the, uh, Japan was really planning for a potential invasion, you know, with conventional forces and uh, MacArthur's staff they figured that there would be at least a million U.S. casualties in that process, so that would have been that would have been a real bloody affair. So the bomb actually saved a lot of lives. We'd already killed more Japanese in Tokyo with conventional bombs than we we did with the atom bombs. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. The patriotism to me is just a matter of doing whatever duty is required of you for your country and uh, I've always tried to stick with that. See, during World War II, you know, it was an all-out effort. Not only the civilian, where they uh, really went to work in these war plants, and they were really uh, dedicated, you know, to, to dealing with that. On these other matters of war, I'll have to say that I'm, I'm really not in favor of a lot of this, because uh, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't solve anything. So I, I would say that uh, it's time that our political leaders tried to find a different solution other than, other than warfare. We want to thank the veterans volunteering on the USS Midway and the veterans of Coronado for sharing their stories today. We also want to thank our special sponsors and the USS Midway for making this USS Midway series possible. Don't miss our upcoming veteran stories on Patriot Plates by liking and subscribing below. I'm retired Marine Corps Major Scott Husing, hoping the next time you see a veteran license plate you'll think about the service and sacrifice behind it. Thanks for watching Patriot Plates. One veteran, one story. Save the Brave connects veterans through outreach programs to build strength of character. Our essential task is to prevent veteran suicide. Save the Brave is committed to providing veterans with post-traumatic stress ways to connect in a safe space. To donate your time, money, or resources, visit savethebrave.org.
reach out to a veteran in need and direct them to save the brave.